we are seeing here how Vidra Maharaj is asking questions to Maitreya. This is the second set of questions as we discussed before. And this is very specific questions. So just like last week we saw questions about how the planetary systems. And now he's asking questions about the four Purusharthas. So this forms the most of the discussion in the further canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. This is a discussion between Maitreya and Yudra. And inside that there will be many other discussions. All the way until the fifth canto. So we have the second canto, third canto now. And there is fourth canto. And there is fifth canto. So all the way until the fifth canto. The sixth canto will deal with many other things. Topics. We will talk about it later. So here, Svidura so is asking, it's a very important topic about the Purusha Artha. So the Dharma Artha Kama Moksha Na Nimittani Avirodhataha. So what does that mean? So Vidra is asking to my prayer, please explain about the four goals of human life. What are the four goals of human life? Dharma, Artha, Kama, and Moksha. So Dharma means religious practices. Artha means you gain economic prosperity by doing religious practices. And Kama means you gain economic prosperity then all, obviously you also get all your desires fulfilled. Right? So when you have good prosperity then your desires are automatically fulfilled. Finally, Moksha. So when you are completely frustrated with all the efforts of getting happiness, then you think about the next life. I should become free from all these things, birth, death, old age, disease. So that is called moksha. Moksha means muchyate iti moksha. That which delivers you from this birth and death cycle is called moksha. So this is a difference between civilized society and an uncivilized society. For uncivilized society, there is no difference between animals and humans. So because their activities are very common with animals. The animals, what do the animals do, Prahlad? Um, they always, the dangerous animals, they come for other animals and the So they do eating. All animals eat. Right? And all animals sleep. Yeah. What is the third activity they do? Produce children. Right? Fourth is they defend themselves. So if some of the animal comes to kill you, kill the animal, or some threatens the animal, the animal defends itself. So that are the four activities that animals do. But if you see in general, the human society also, they do the four same things. So they do the same sleeping, eating, mating, and defending. But they do in a much more sophisticated way. We have a big houses and we do our activities inside the house. We make nice palatable food, food dishes, and then we eat them, we sleep. We do the same activities. But what is the difference between the animals and humans? The difference is humans have a sense of, should have a sense of dharma. Dharma means that which is very innate, natural to you, it's called dharma. So, human beings have an innate nature to inquire. They have a sense of morality. They have a sense of ethics. So that's what differentiates a human from an animal. samanya metat dharmo hi eka adiko visheshu dharmena hina samanaha. Mahabharata says this. Yudhishthira Maharaj is saying in Mahabharata that there is no difference between animals and humans because the activities are the same. But only difference is dharmo hi eka diko visheshu. Followance or observance of religious practices or spiritual practices. That's what should make the difference. So that is the question here from Vidra also. In a civilized society, the humans they look for economic prosperity, just like everybody else. 
In uncivilized society also, they look for economic prosperity. Everybody wants to be rich and rich and richer, right? And everybody wants prosperity in their life. They want all their desires fulfilled. But the difference between civilized and uncivilized is in uncivilized society are barbarians. So they get all these things by by hook or crook or by even what they say, beg, borrow or steal. Whatever means you adopt doesn't matter. As long as you can get your happiness, then you are perfectly fine. So that is what the philosophy of Charvaka. Charvaka philosophy is that uh, <clears throat> whether you pranam kritva dhutam prive yavad jive sukam jive ehi dehasya bhutasya punam agaram kutam bhave that is what is the Charvaka philosophy. So whether you borrow, doesn't matter, borrow the money and have your high life have your best prosperous or enjoyable life. Not prosperous, enjoyable. Enjoy by beg, borrow, steal, doesn't matter. Because what happens to this body after death, it all goes to become ashes. So it's all good, it doesn't matter how you live this life. As long as you live, live a king life king size. So that is their philosophy. So that is the modern philosophy also of the uncivilized society. So they want to do, doesn't matter, they give you loans, Free loans, take the loans, doesn't matter. And then you, yeah, you use your credit card as much as you want, doesn't matter. And then uh, whether you are able to pay or not, nobody advises you on that. All they give you is give you money in your hand and tempt you to spend more and more. And then they will they will get their money from you by means of taking back all your sources of livelihood. They take your paycheck, they take your uh, um, house and they take everything from you. So they all tempt you to spend money and then they take back everything from you. So that is the modern economics. So, Vidura Maharaj is saying, don't, um, he is very clearly asking questions. So in a civilized society, how do one achieve these four Purusharthas? Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha. <coughs> Moksha means, is the opposite of material life. Material life is expansion. Pravritti marga. Pravritti marga means the method of going and trying to seek more happiness in this life. Nivritti marga means the method of or the process of leaving things and then detaching yourself. Pravritti marga means attaching yourself. Nivritti marga means detaching yourself. So, Nivritti marga, the last one is the mokshana. So moksha means ultimate liberation of the soul. So that is a should be a topic of discussion in the civilized society. The civilized society, when there is dharma, obviously there will be a talk of moksha. Because dharma is designed in such a way that eventually you will develop a desire for moksha. These four things are very sequential. Starts with dharma, followers of dharma, just like you see Dishra Maharaj. He is following dharma a number of times. You see Lord Rama, he follows dharma a number of times. He sets a very high ideal standard, a benchmark for everybody to follow. A king, how he can follow his dharma. And then, that's his process. So he follows dharma, then obviously you get the economic prospect. So that is the, in a civilized society. But in uncivilized society, they don't, uh, they don't have emphasis on dharma. It doesn't matter whether you follow spirituality or not. Some or other you should live, very, you should have a good money. So a good example is our, in, our, in our American society also. Somebody became a president, I don't want to take a name. It's all because of his money power, right? So he put a lot of money in the election campaign and then his policies were all haphazard and then it was all um, disastrous to say the least. But he had his way because he had a lot of money. And he did some things, everybody does some something right, but most of the people do the wrong things. Because they are not educated in Dharma. They are not educated in what is, how should a king follow his rules and regulations. So, obviously they will look for that prosperity and the namesake they will try to help in other, the public also to get some good life. And they will 
have helped the public public to lead their life to satisfy their desires. Whether the desires are right or wrong, nobody wonders. Nobody cares about it. As long as you can get your desires fulfilled, so and as long as you are satisfied, that means you vote for me. So politicians they think that that they should somehow satisfy the desires of people and they'll vote. This is very, very common in in even in societies like in India, third world countries, the politicians are so low. All throughout the five years of rule, they will make money by making scams, by making corruption, corrupt schemes. And at the end of when it comes uh, time for election, what will they do? They will bribe the voters. They will say, I will give you a, a free computer for all the students. They will give you a lot of freebies to the public. And they will even bribe them by giving money to vote for them. Or they will give them uh, liquor just before the day of election. <laughs> they will all <laughs> This is a reality, it's happening. And it happens in every election in India. So, mm -hmm. so they bribe the voters to vote for them. And the voters are all they're all so shudra, so much of a shudra. They don't really have any any brain. They don't think what is their field welfare. As long as they get their some money in their hand and then they get some something to uh, intoxicate themselves, they're happy. They think, okay, if we vote for them. Yeah. And another five years of rule they get and then they continue to lead their corrupt la life, make amass wealth for themselves. So this is what uncivilized society is. Uncivilized society you acquire wealth by following dharma, just like Vishnu Maharaj and Lord Rama. So they did not take the, any any other big way. They followed the rules and regulations. They took the hard path. They worked their way, and the economic prosperity automatically came. But by the time the economic prosperity came, they are already kind of renounced. Right? Vishnu Maharaj he got his kingdom back, but he was never happy with the kingdom. He said, "Oh, my, I am the cause for so many deaths." So yeah. people died because of me. So he was so much in, in duality, so much in bewilder. So he goes and talks to Bhishma Dev, and then he hears all the nice instructions from Bhishma. And that's when he gets some motivation to rule the kingdom. So that is the Dharma Artha Kama Moksha. Dharma Artha Kama Moksha is a sequence. So obviously they will look for spiritual emancipation of the soul. That's what it leads. You follow dharma. That's why the prescription is follow dharma at all times. Shri Prabhupada is also saying follow the Varnashrama dharma, follow the Bhagavata dharma. So that because dharma will automatically lead you to renunciation, lead you to detachment. Slowly you detach yourself from the material on the sense of things. And detachment is very important for attachment to Krishna. So if you're not detached in material things, attachment is not fully. Manifest. So, Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Yavasayatrikabuddhi samaduna vidhiya. For some, someone who is attached to enjoyment, and Aishwarya means wealth, Boga means enjoyment. For such people, the desire to desire for spiritual emancipation doesn't even dawn in their mind. Because they're so much attached to these things. So they will not be able to detach themselves from them. So that seems like, a, why would I even do this? Why would I go to temple? Why would I chant Hare Krishna? I have everything nice in my life. I have my computers. I can watch whatever movies I want. I can go wherever I want. I have so much money. I can travel to uh, different places where I like go to uh, different um, Caribbean islands, go for a cruise, and go for uh, different other places. Alaska, have some nice time, or go to Las Vegas, right? So that is where thinking. The thinking is, how can I enjoy more and more? So the, the thought of moksha does not come in there. The thought of detachment does not come in there. Detachment comes only when you detach from the, from follow dharma. When you follow dharma automatically, you are lucky poised. You have a good understanding about that you can get profit or loss does not disturb you. Victory or defeat does not disturb you. You are continuing to do your dharma. That's important. 
that is what is the importance of this verse. Vidura is asking how one can follow dharma and become a moksha. Abhirodhataha means that according to the rules of the scriptures, not in opposition to the rules of scriptures. Shruta secha vidim tutak. Shruta means shruti. Shruti means vedas. How we can obtain one's desires by following shruti. And uh, he also asked question, what is the description of rules and regulation? Vartaya danda niti. Danda means punishment. Niti means the rules. Vartaya means professions. So according to the according to the shruti or according to the, the scriptures, what is the correct way to follow one's profession? What is the what is the right and wrong things? So he is asking the questions to um, Maitre. This looks very um, mundane to some extent. It's not a spiritual questions, but this is also important because we are all in that platform. We are in the, not in the platform of very high spiritual. Um, Paramahamsa stage. So we are at the stage of how I can make my ends meet, how I can maintain a decent life, how I can give a good education to my children, so how I can make myself better in a material sense. So we are thinking positively looking at material things, not in a negative things, not in terms of enjoyment. That is good. So as long as you follow Dharma, you can you can get Artha. Artha means you can get more businesses. You can better yourself in your life. That is, that is all right. So then comes the next question. Shraddhas Sicha Vidim Brahman Vitranam Sarkam Evacha Ganhanakshatra Tarana Kala Vaya Kala Vayava Samasthitam. So the next question is that from Vidura is that, okay, this is for the mundane material life, but what about the, the cosmos? So you have something called as Pitraloka. Right, that is forefathers of that. I think we discussed last week also, right? Pitra Loka and the Pitras and the things. So what are the regulations in worshipping them? So it's very important. So one thing is that this human life, the one of the dharma of human life is to giving respects to the forefathers. Because the forefathers, if you remember the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says the Arjuna says the Bhagavad Gita, the first chapter. That um, if all these people are killed in this war, then what will happen? The women folk, so they will be left protectionless. And that will lead to unwanted progeny, unwanted children, and they will not be properly given proper samskaras or proper uh, rights in their birth. They will not be taught proper education. And they will all go in an improper way. Society will all be full of them. Society will be full of um, what do you call it? misguided children and they will wreak havoc in society. So, this is very important. So, one should understand the importance of forefathers because the, 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 just like a father is important in the family, the mother is also important. The mother can give love to the children, but the father is the one who educates the children in the right way what is right, what is wrong, and puts emphasis on that. Those so the, the child gets a very balanced teaching. They get love, protection, and affection from the mother. They also get the proper direction how to live in this world from the father. So we should be thankful for them, for the fathers. Right? We have fathers here tomorrow, I believe. Tomorrow's fathers. Is that correct? I don't know. <laughs> I don't keep track of fathers. Yes, tomorrow's no. fathers. Yeah. So tomorrow I'll be giving class, so I should, I'm supposed to talk on that also. <coughs> So the father gives the proper direction, sets the right momentum, sets the right direction for the child to pursue in their life. So one should always be thankful for the forefathers. So that is why in the very important thing in the aspect of the the child bearing is to teach the right samskaras. And one of the important samskara is Pitradan or Pindadan. So one should offer oblations to the forefathers the right times of different days, the priest knows that. So you have to offer oblations. You have to do a different uh, yajna, and then you have to give the result of the yajna to the forefathers. So that the forefathers will get the benefit of the prasad, Supreme Lord's prasad, 
and they might be stuck in different places, either the hellish planets because they have did something wrong in their life, they did something sinful, they are stuck in the hellish planets. So this prashada would reach to them and they will get liberation from that stage and they will get their next birth very soon. So that is why having a samskaras is very important. Teaching samskaras to children is very important. The children will continue to do this pindadan and that will help in, the, in our future. Let us say we are stuck in some sinful situation in the, in the hellish planets. Then if the children offer some prashad to us and then reach us and then help us come out of the hellish planets. So this is a very important thinking, thought process in the Indian thinking, in the Dharmic thinking. And one should have children, we should look into that. So that is why the word putraha, putraha means son. Putu trayate iti putraha. So one who delivers oneself from the hellish planets called putu, it's called putra. A son delivers one from the hellish planet called as putu. So one should always educate the children very nicely in the Krishna God's principles. And then they can help us in our future. So even Prahlad, Lord Narasimhadev says in the 7th end of Srimad Bhagavatam. So because you did a wonderful devotional service, Prahlad, all your forefathers who are uh, seven above and seven below, they will all be delivered, they will all be liberated. So if someone becomes a pure devotee of Krishna, then all forefathers will also get automatically delivered. So there is no need for anything. So just becoming a devotee itself is the greatest thing. So that is very important. If becoming a pure devotee is very, very rare. It's almost uh, impossible to find a pure devotee. Because we all have desires, material desires. And a pure devotee means he has absolutely no material desires. Anya abhilashina shunyam jnana karmadi anavatam. So he has absolutely no material desires. His only desire is to serve Krishna at all times. So one should aspire to become a pure devotee. It is going to be very difficult. At least the desire to become a pure devotee should be there. Then there is a hope for that. And one should definitely have mercy of the spiritual masters, one should have mercy of Krishna. And one should associate with the right devotees who can inspire us in this, in this path. So that is very important. So once we follow these things, then we will automatically come to the point of devotional service to Krishna. <coughs> so I will stop here and look for any questions. Anybody has any questions? Any comments, any questions? Mm -hmm. All right. So the last two were part of the verses, I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Graha nakshatra tarana khala vayava samasitam. So the question that uh, Ibra is asking is, how does this planet's the stars are how do they all move about in this universe? Who is asking? Vidura. Mm -hmm. This is a topic that we again dealt last week also, right? Mm -hmm. So this will also be answered in the fifth canto. Actually all the stars mm -hmm. according to Srimad Bhagavatam, they are actually the vehicles mm -hmm. of the great sages, the head planetary system, there are sages. So you have this Janna Loka, Kapha Loka, Maha Loka, and uh, Satya Loka. So the sages, they move about in their vehicles. And that is the stars, according to the Bhagavatam. And uh, it is not the sun. So in modern astronomy or astrophysics, they say all stars are like suns. And they all produce their own light, all produce their own heat and light. But according to Bhagavatam, according to these things, all this, the stars and nakshatras, and the, the, they are all vehicles of great luminaries so who are illuminated by themselves because of their pages, because of their prowess, of their spiritual prowess. So that is very important to understand. So that we will be discussing in the book, Kant of Shiva So I'll stop here. Uh, sure. Anybody? Okay. Yes, um, I was, I'm currently reading the third Kant part one and catching up where we are. But So I read that Okay, so basically, Uddhava, um, Krishna told the Uddhava the contents of the Gita, in which Maitreya overheard. 
and Maitreya wanted to learn from Uddhava, but uh, Maitreya was actually uh, the, oh no, uh, uh, Pala, yeah, not Maitreya, Vidura wanted to learn from Uddhava. But Vidura inquired Uddhava, but uh, uh, Vidura was his elder. And so he looked at him as, uh, so Uddhava looked at Vidura's authority, so he sent him to inquire from Maitreya. And I read that, you know, Maitreya, was, um, he got the information directly from the Lord, therefore he was qualified. But I thought it was indirectly from the Lord because he overheard. And that's why I was confused because it says in stream in uh, first canto, third part, Third canto part on uh, one that he directly received um, you know, this from Krishna. So I, I I don't know, you know, it was it directly or indirectly, you know? Yeah. So even the whole Shivat Bhagavatam if you see, so it is the discussion between Shukde Goswami and Parishad. Yeah. But there are so many sages sitting there. And they are hearing it. That is not wrong to overhear. Mm -hmm. And one of them was Sutta Goswami. And Sutta Goswami goes and narrates this Srimad Bhagavatam mm -hmm. Sages and Naimish Yeah. There are two, two things happen. The Ganges, the bank of river Ganges, Parikshit hears from Sutta Goswami. Mm -hmm. The Sutta Goswami is over here. And he goes to Naimish Who to who? Sutta Goswami. What does he go, who does he go to? He goes to a place called Naimish Oh, okay. Where there are already Sages sitting there. Mm -hmm. And they ask Sutta Goswami, oh, you heard from he still is Srimad So then he narrates, re narrates the whole thing. That is how it is narration with the narration. Mm -hmm. So overhearing is all right as long as the speaker is, mm -hmm. is okay with it. So although he indirectly heard that was still counted as directly receiving the knowledge. And also, um, although it was stated that he isn't a pure devotee, he had perfect understanding and perfect uh, remembrance of the knowledge. Um, he was still not a, he was not a pure devotee though he was not a pure devotee but he had the perfect understanding of knowledge which he could reiterate to Vidura who was a pure devotee that's true okay. he was not a pure devotee in the sense he has a tinge of knowledge mm -hmm. he wants to he has a desire for knowledge yeah that is there mm -hmm. so when, like many of us we have a desire for material welfare mm -hmm. and also devotion yeah our devotion is coupled with material Desire for material wealth. Yeah. yeah. So we go to Krishna and sometimes pray, please give me some, help me in this, relief from this disease, yeah. or help me in this, give me this thing. Yeah. So we have material desire. Mm -hmm. But with our Maitreya was not like that. So yeah. he was not a material type, but he was a jnani type. Gotcha. So he, had, he had desire for knowledge, to mm -hmm. understand better things. Yeah. More than desire for serving. Yeah. But he had that. It's a mix of devotion and knowledge, mm -hmm. which is not wrong. Yeah. And there are some devotees who are like that. So they have a, they're, they're so much attached to Srimad Bhagavatam, mm -hmm. they would like to read more. But if you ask them to uh, maybe do some menial service, maybe they may not be so much interested mm -hmm. in menial service. So they have, everybody has a different, yeah. different levels and, of... And could you say that since, although Maitreya was overhearing uh, Uddhava and Krishna speak, Krishna ultimately knew that Maitreya was listening and allow him to listen so you could say that he was directly That's speaking point. to him as well? Yes. Just like Sukade Goswami allowed Sukade Goswami to listen. Yeah. So Lord Krishna knew at least if nothing happens without Krishna's sanction. Yeah. So the, even my prayer coming there is because of Krishna's willing. Yeah. Krishna directing him as Paramatma to come there. Yeah. So it is his, for his purification. Yeah. So he hearing the whole Shiva, uh, the discussion between Krishna and Uddhava, that was his purification. Okay. And he must have become a pure devotee after that. Yeah. Before that, he may not be a pure devotee. Yeah. So that is way of purifying. Okay. All right. So if somebody hears from Krishna attentively, obviously he gets purified. Okay. So we shouldn't be saying after hearing, he's yeah. not a pure devotee. Yeah. But before I'll, hearing, he was not a pure devotee. Okay. And one more question. I'll, I, I don't know. I was, I was looking, I was reading a little bit about Buddhism. And they have a Buddha named Maitreya. Um, that they have who said is appear or has already appeared or both. Uh, is there any connection between the our Maitreya and the Buddha Maitreya? The Maitreya I mean, the Maitreya comes from Sanskrit, right? The name Maitreya. I was just thinking, is there a connection or is it just the name, the same the name? Is the same? Maitreya comes because he was the son of Mitra. Mm -hmm. Maybe God Mitra. Yeah. So Mitra's son because Maitreya. Mm -hmm. Like that. 
Yeah. So, do you, have you heard about the Maitreya in Buddhism before? I don't know. You never heard? Oh, okay. Yeah. I was wondering. He has, there's a, there's a, a, there's a Buddha with the same name as our Maitreya. His name is Maitreya. Buddha well. or Buddha follow? Buddha. There's different Buddhas. Like, what, like, you know, there's not, there's Buddha and there's like, you know, you know which was, he had a name, you know, Lord Vishnu Buddha. But there's different Buddhas as well. Like, uh, you know, there's a, so his is, a, he's, his name is Maitreya. Which uh, he's a the Buddha says he's a, he's to appear in the future or whatever and like. Will you thousands, appear in the future? Yeah, I don't know. And so how, how many hundreds or thousands of years or a thousand years or whatever, you know. So probably within the golden age, I don't know, but it was very interesting. <laughs> but anywho, it was said that although whatever whether that prophecy be true or not, I don't know if it was it was from. Uh, I don't think it was from the Vedas. It may have been just prophesied by Nostradamus. I don't remember which one, but I think maybe Nostradamus. That it says that um, basically before, as the golden age approaches, basically when we get to, when it gets to the sixth Dalai Lama, I believe it's the sixth, that or whatever I don't know how many number it said, that Dalai Lama would become dethroned and Buddhism would disappear, and that during Dalai Lama, the number that was predicted. Um, of the Dalai Lama, that Dalai Lama was dethroned. That number that is predicted. And so essentially, Buddhism is supposed to disappear from here on out. Like, supposed to slowly, slowly just dwindle away. So that was, I don't know, I think it was prophesied by Nostradamus. But it was interesting because that Dalai Lama got dethroned. So, you know, there's, Nostradamus, he has great credibility. He's prophesied so many different things. You know? yeah. So it's, he also prophesied that, um, also appear, uh, approaching the golden age that basically Russia would would become Vedic, Russia would become overcome by Vedic belief and that India and Russia would uh, I believe become allies to uh, I think uh, fight the Middle East and I think it's the Middle East I believe but it says like uh, five lakhs or 500,000 Indians would die or something but that was just something I read that's I had a little input. That, so, you know, do what you want with that information. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Nice one. Thank you. Jai.